Hello and welcome to the High and Low Podcast. I'm Alan. And I'm Rialda. Welcome back, Rialda. Oh my god. How long has it been? It's been like five years <laughs> since, <laughs> since we did this. I forgot we still did this. I know. We <laughs> just like went about our lives and like, oh, remember that podcast we used to do? Yeah. Yeah, I remember oh, it. That was fun. Well, we're getting we're getting back into it slowly. Yes. And easily yes. because we're not doing a full blown Real de now and complain about things. No, not not what our fans expect us to do. That's, that'll be coming shortly, though, right? That's true. Yes, we have a an interesting show coming up. Um, should we should we say we what it give is? Give a little preview of what we think it's going to be. Um, I think we're going to focus on the new, kind of semi new, but really popular genre of movies, TVs, Zom- TVs, and TVs and books. books. And music? <laughs> Probably. Zombies. We're going to talk about zombies. Zombies and vampires. And vampires? We're not going to leave vampires out. All right. Yeah. So that, that'll be fun. We're going to have some guests. Um, we have some special guests. Co-hosts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The experts on yeah, the, the subject. The experts, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's coming up next. Yeah, look for that. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime... Uh, what I did, Rialda, recently... Tell me, Alan. ...was talk to one Mr. Ken Scott. Oh, my God. Yeah, you don't know who Ken Scott is, do you? Yeah, I do, from this interview. Well, now I told you. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to be like, who's Ken Scott? Who's Ken Scott? Well, Rialda, I'll tell you. <laughs> Ken Scott. Ken Scott was a um, an engineer, a recording engineer, at um, Abbey Road Studios... In um, the 60s, and if anyone is familiar with the 60s <laughs> and Abbey Road, you know what that probably means. Um, yes, he w- he was an engineer for the uh, for the Beatles, uh, um, worked with them and George Martin, obviously. But um, he uh, was an assistant engineer. Uh, we talk a little bit about this, but uh, right up from uh, Hard Day's Night. And then became full engineer, um, like uh, during Magical Mystery Tour, and then recorded the White Album. He's he's pretty much responsible for the recording of the White Album because uh, George Martin kind of went on holiday. He was barely there, you know, all the bickering that was going on. Um, Ken ended up being the guy who sort of corralled everything and recorded everything and, and worked on songs. And that's great. So that's obviously a big deal. Um, but it doesn't stop there because then he goes on to uh, record some other groups at the time that were, uh, he moves to Trident Studios and he records, uh, although he did this at, at Abbey Road, he, he records Jeff Beck, the first Jeff Beck album, which is a classic album, um, the album Truth, uh, the one with Rod Stewart, and great album. And then uh, and some Procol Harum, he works on Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett. As in the waning days of uh, Sid Barrett's mental state, wow, um, uh, various and sundry things, and then he stumbles upon a um, little-known guy named uh, David Jones, or as he's later known, David Bowie, um, and works on uh, some David Bowie tracks uh, before Bowie becomes famous, and then uh, gets together with him to record. What ends up being Hunky Dory, which of course is a huge breakthrough, and still, some would argue Bowie's best album. Mm-hmm. Still, some prefer Ziggy Stardust, but of course the follow-up was Ziggy Stardust, and he did that too. And he also worked on uh, Aladdin Sane and uh, and um, one of the pinups, I think. So he worked with Bowie for a while. Not to stop there, he worked with uh, Elton John. He was the engineer for Elton John, recording all of Elton John's best albums. Wow. Mad Man Across the Water, uh, Hockey Chateau, you know, like Rocket Man and mm-hmm. Crocodile Rock, and all the best Elton John songs. Ken Scott recorded them. Um, all that sound. Levon, uh, Mona Lisa's in Manhattan. It's just, can I ask you something? I yeah. mean, this is going to sound silly, but I really don't know what that means when you say he created the sound. I mean, yeah. what does the sound... Is he a sound producer? Or yeah, is he, it's a good question. 
I mean, um, what what do they do? I always wonder because they have this huge board, kind of like you have a miniature one, but they have a huge board. They seem to be they seem to be recording different instruments yeah. and vocals separately, and then they blend it together. But is it up to them how the song is essentially going to sound on the record? Pretty much, because uh, you know uh, the way it used to be segregated, and we talk a little bit about this, but the the producer was really like uh, at the time like an A and R man and an arranger. So he would be more concerned about how the song would be sort of like commercially, how it would sell or how, how they could, you know, position it. So like mm-hmm. George Martin, when the, 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 when the Beatles first walked in, George Martin signed them. You know, he was the producer, but he also was the guy who said, okay, this band is signed. Right. And um, <clears throat> he would listen to the songs and say, all right, well, maybe you want to make this a little more up-tempo to make it more commercial or you want to do this or... And then he would work with he work with arrangements and and things like that. But behind the scenes, and this is um, little known, is that the engineers are the ones who really are responsible for how the thing sounds, because they're the ones who actually physically place the mics in front of the amps. You know, mm-hmm. what angle is it? Uh, how far away is it? Um, what mics you're using? In what combination? Right. Um, what's the studio? set up like what's the sound of the room so it's like the so- they, they look they focus on the science of the sound the sound yeah so like anything you think about how something sounds and a lot of the records he worked on you think of the Bowie albums they sound very particular right and we talk about that it's it's that they're responsible for that sound right and he obviously has to collaborate with the artist you know he has to tell them like I want it to sound can it, do they tell them or do they mm-hmm. kind of yeah, it, it varies, I, I think, but, um, you know, a lot of them don't know. Like, John Lennon, you know, famously had the thing where he, he wanted, uh, he came in with the song Tomorrow Never Knows, and he said he wanted the sound, his voice to sound like a thousand Buddhist monks chanting from a mountaintop. You know, or he would say something like, uh, you know, it should sound more red, you know, whatever. or like they, <laughs> And they have to kind of translate right. the sort of artist's idea into sound. I mean, they're working for the artist, but, um, or with the artist, but, uh, you know, they, they're the ones who have to physically or, or actually do it, right? you know, and make it real. So anything that you hear, you know, that's really the work of engineers primarily. Okay. I just wasn't sure. That's why they're so important. And, and they're, you know, they really never got the credit that they deserved. Um, and he was mentioning, they only started putting engineering credits on records and probably like around 1970 or so. It was late to the game. But um, uh, anyway, so where was I? Elton John, then he works with uh, uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra, which is a seminal jazz rock fusion band um, with some of the people from Miles Davis's group and um, John McLaughlin. And uh, they become hugely influential. Um, it's a really amazing... the. <laughs> And then he works with Super Tramp and does uh, Crime of the Century, which is still regarded as one of the best sounding albums ever. It's an audiophile masterpiece, um, sort of like Dark Side of the Moon, who was, which was of course recorded recorded by Alan Parsons, who was another engineer from Abbey Road. Um, basically, you find out these guys got really great training at Abbey Road, and they were just they knew how to get good sound. And then uh, we didn't really get into it, but he also uh, was the manager and producer for uh, Missing Persons, who had a couple hits in the in the early '80s, including a song called uh, "Words." I get what are words for when no one listens anymore? Oh yeah, you know yeah, that song? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Missing Persons. <laughs> cool. It's a good song, actually. Do you hear me? Something like that. <laughs> it's it's actually catchy. Good song. Uh, and you know he worked with a bunch of other. He did mixing for the Stones um, mm-hmm. on on uh, Sticky Fingers, and I mean it just it's ridiculous. Right. His really. resume is impressive. His resume <laughs> is just absurd. And uh, you know we talked all about that, and it just we had a great conversation. He was a wonderful guy to talk to. He's got a new book out called uh, Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust. It's coming out I think in a month or so. You can pre order it on Amazon. You should. It's a lot of fun to read if you like music. A lot of anecdotes about just working with the artist. Oh, we also did Lou Reed's Transformer. Oh, wow. A little album like that. Forgot about that one, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, so, uh, that being said, 
Um, All right, let's hear it. You want to just get into it? Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, I got snagged by YouTube, so I'm talking over this section, so hopefully it won't catch it again, and you can listen to the interview undisturbed. I really enjoyed the book. I, I got through it in record time. Um, it was just so much fun just going right through. Um, and, uh, well, I figured it might be a good place to uh, start at the beginning. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, talking to you that uh, you've done too much because yeah. <laughs> it's very hard I'm you know trying to find I uh, figure out what to ask you and you realize I could go on for I, I could go on for pages I'm, I'm writing up questions I'm thinking this guy has just done too many things well I, it, it, in, a, in a way that has been that has been good for my brain but bad for business because a and r guys like to uh, pigeonhole yeah everything from acts to producers to managers. And the trouble was they could never pigeonhole me. So I was never the, the sort of first thought of A&R people, which, which mm. in, in, in certain respects was probably good. But uh, Right. That, that yeah. probably got tougher as they, they they got more control, right, as time went on? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I imagine, I'm, I'm trying to piece it together. It's I'm, an interesting question you bring up is to how... You know, a lot of people know your um, your your sort of discography and and you know, the, you know going from the Beatles to David Bowie to Elton John to Super Tramp. I, I got myself wondering, and sometimes you talk about this, but you know, how does one find out about Ken Scott, or how does one how does David Bowie um, say, hmm, you know, this is the guy, or do you just happen to he goes into Trident and and you're just there? Well, I, as, as I say in the book, it's, I started off just engineering the first two two projects. Right. I was just, he was an unknown act, and I, I uh, Tony Visconti, the producer, wasn't particularly well known at that point. So uh, I was just put on, this, on the sessions. That was due to whoever it was, was was booking time in the studio at that point. I can't remember who it was, whether it was right. Barry, it may have been Barry Sheffield was doing it, but... It was. I was just put on the sessions. It was after doing two albums and then working with with David on something that he was producing and just talking to him. And it was that led to Hunky Dory. Do you think that it, being it, in the right, being in the right place at the right time? But I've I have been in the right place at the right time too many times for me to believe it's just luck. Yeah, it is strange. <laughs> it's strange. Yeah. But uh, I'm wondering, like back, you know, back then, if uh, the role of the engineer was as appreciated as, as it is now. I mean, you know, it's kind of ironic with the way I think sound quality has gotten with recent pop music, but that's a whole other discussion. But, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, when my, that's when my grumpy old man starts to appear. I'm, I'm with you. But uh, yeah. the, uh, it seems that now, at least in certain circles, there's more of an appreciation for what the engineer did. But I'm wondering if back then, if even people really gave it a second thought no they, they didn't it, it's when when i started i would say i want to be a recording engineer and most people had no idea what the hell i was talking about uh, and that i kind of kept going even when when i had the gig it, it was uh most people didn't know what it was and let's face it record companies didn't help emi who i worked with for, for many years they wouldn't. They refused to put uh, engineering credits on on album sleeves. Right. It wasn't on the Beatles. It wasn't until uh, the recent reissues that any of us got any credits. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it it's understandable that people didn't know too much about it or or sort of have much say about recording engineers because they had no idea what they were. Yeah. When people talk about sound, I think anybody who's been in a studio knows that. And it comes down to, it probably comes down to a couple things: uh, the room and and where you put the mics, and you know that's the engineer right there, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, right. Yeah. Well, I I always I've always looked at it as a record producer 
is a film director, and the the recording engineer is the uh, director of photography. The right. DP. Yeah. It's, they, they have the, the, exactly the same roles, just in different areas, kind of thing. Right. Well, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get a little, uh, try to get a little more specific uh, on a couple sure. things, if I could. Um, you came up at a time. Now, you you talk about uh, in the book about uh, you know the sort of I, I would would you say the standard uh, engineering training at Abbey Road in the '60s, going from uh, the button pusher to a tape operator or tape or the other way around, or is it something like yeah, that? Yeah, no, no, it was it was standard. I do have to correct you on one thing. I thought you said in the 50s. I'm not <laughs> quite that old. <laughs> I did say 60s. I hope I said 60s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, that was that was the standard procedure then. As, as to a point, it was, I think, in the small number of studios that were around. I know Decca, which was just down the road, had a, a similar kind of thing. I don't know if at Decca they, they put you into cutting, mastering, before allowing you to be an engineer. That, that to me, was one of the most brilliant aspects of the training at Abbey Road because that whole thing of you you need to know the final product and its limitations before you can go into the easier going onto tape situation. You could right. get away with a lot more on tape than you could on vinyl. So that, that thought process, I, quite often we would, why do we have to go through this first? We just wanted to get straight behind the board and start working with the artists. Well, right. it made absolute sense not to do it that way. And brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But that was something that came. They'd been around for so long. They, they started, they would, I'm sure at one point, they put someone straight onto uh, engineering and realized, hang on, this ain't going to work because he's screwing it up. And so they started this other way of training, and it was great. Yeah, being a vinyl junkie myself, I, I know what you're talking about. For but for people who don't know what you're talking about, you there are limitations yeah. to recording uh, certain uh, frequencies on vinyl. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's you can't have as much low end on vinyl because it, it makes the grooves. <laughs> uh, it, it will it will make the pickup arm, the tone arm, jump if there's too much bass on there. Right. And that was one of the one of the, the EMI rules was that. They had to chop off the lower certain frequency, and I can't remember what that frequency was. But it was because at one point on uh, one of the Beatles singles, there was a bit too much low end, and they had a massive amount of returns because all of the singles were jumping. So right. after that, they had to the mastering engineers had to put a, a cut off. In fact, it may actually have just been built into the system because I I. When I was mastering, I don't remember ever actually putting something across it to get rid of the low end. I think it was something they they put into the system. You also had to be careful of a uh, of phase because that would also make a final jump on tape. It just, for me, uh, something being out of phase, it just feels weird. Mm -hmm. But you can still record it. Whereas vinyl, no, it will make it jump. Uh, you can't just. You have to be very careful of, of volume going onto a disc. Right. All, all of that kind of thing. Right. Now you came. You were, I believe, made an assistant engineer, if that, that is correct, around the time of uh, Magical Mystery Tour. Is that correct? No, assistant engineer. I started off on side two of Abbey Road. Uh, of, of Abbey Road. God, side two of a hard day's night. Oh, so you were okay. You were assistant engineer back then. And then yeah, you, I was. I, I worked as an assistant engineer with the Beatles from Side Two of a Hard Day's Night through Rubber Soul. Oh, okay. So, so uh, you you became engineer then uh, around Mad Time Magical Mystery Tour. Well, okay, then after, after Rubber Soul, I then uh, went up and learned cutting, mastering. And then after doing that for a couple of years, that's when I moved down and engineered uh, some of Magical Mystery Tour. Okay. All right. Yeah. What I'm getting at is. is um, Coming to talking about the White Album, which is probably, um, you know, it, probably what a lot of people still associate you with uh, to this day, especially, I mean, in particular, because I believe at the time, uh, you know, uh, George Martin even was in and out, from what I understand, um, 
and you were handling a lot of that recording there. Um, well, yeah, but then George, George came from uh, an era when the the producer, he, he wasn't even called a producer at that point. He was the A&R man, because originally A&R men, they, they were the producers. They found the material. They, they booked the studio. They, they were in charge exactly the same way as a producer is these days. Right. Uh, but they, they were never concerned with the, the sound side of things. <laughs> that, they, that was just left up to the engineer. Right. So George, George disappearing, uh, going on vacation during the White Album, as engineer, that, that didn't affect me. It, it led to sort of some decisions being needed to, needing to be made that would normally have been his decision. But then there was Chris Thomas, who was his assistant, that mm -hmm. was also learning his gig at the same time. So he, he jumped in and was making some of the decisions for George, and it worked really well. Yeah, it's amazing when you consider the youth of everybody involved at the time. I mean, the Beatles were still young. Well, that, you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, was, I was recording the biggest band in the world when I was 21. Yeah, amazing. Insane. <laughs> Now, the, what I'm trying to lead up to is this idea that you, you came up through the band through the most experimental time. Um, and then on the White Album, you know, I, I was curious if, if, you know, this was ever a conscious thing or not. But there seemed to be a kind of a retrenchment in the experiment in sound. I mean, I know you were still... Obviously, they were still doing things like Revolution Number no. Nine, and 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 there was still experimentation. There's there's backwards things, and you know, yeah. I don't think they ever gave yeah. it up. But I, I think you know what I mean in terms of the kind of trippy sound of 1967 going into the White Album. It seems to be a pulling back. I mean, do you know if that was a conscious but, effort or? Yes, there, 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 I don't know that I would say that experimentation was was pulled back. They certainly wanted to get back a little more to basics, much uh, more of a rock and roll album. Mm -hmm. it, it was uh, Pepper was such a production, right? And uh, they, they wanted to get back more to their roots, right? So, in other words, we're not going to make this too flowery or too baroque. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that must and, have been. Yeah, that, as I say, definitely that was a conscious effort on their part. Yeah, and um, I think, you know, it's funny that, I wonder if this is why, but I think if you ask a lot of younger people today who are just getting into the Beatles, just discovering them, um, the White Album seems to come up almost more than any other album as, as being among the favorites. You know, the, yes. it's, it's, I never, you know, when I was, um, when I was like coming of age, you know, probably in the like late seventies, early eighties and discovered them, you know, it was the tip, you know, you had uh, the Abbey roads, the Sergeant peppers, the occasionally the yep. rubber souls. And those were the consensus was those were the, the top albums. White album was considered kind of scattershot at the time. Yeah. It's right. only gained in, um, in, uh, stature. I wonder what you, what do you attribute that to? I, I, I know what, what it is from the sort of immediate time, and that is that Pepper had, uh, had raised the bar so high, and people expected the Beatles to try and push it even higher. But they did the complete opposite, they, they, which was very much the Beatles. They, they brought the bar down a bit, for the White Album, and I think a lot of people didn't like it because it didn't do, it didn't go even further than Pepper. It was it was back to basics. Yeah. And, but I think over time, it, it's people have realized this was a great little rock and roll band. That was how they started, and almost to the point, that's how they finished up. Yeah. And I, I think it's appreciated for that. I think it, it's it fits in. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think a cert, certain amount of the tracks fits in with the, the whole grunge thing. Yeah. Because it's dirt, some of it's dirty. It, it's basic rock and roll. It, it's... Oh, yeah, I mean... From... It, 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 it fits in with the Foo Fighters and all of that kind of thing these days. So I think that, that could be a lot 
a lot of why the kids like it more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it definitely there's there's such a diversity on there too. Yeah, probably more than any other any other record. You they ever you got everything on there. It's it's really amazing. Yeah, that's why it had to be a double album. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yeah. uh, after that, you um, you move on to uh, Trident. Yes. At the time, and. Yes. Um, from what I understand, you're you're basically doing um, you know, a lot of things crop up, and again, I I could go off on so many sidetracks here. Jeff Beck, uh, you do the first Jeff Beck album is a classic album. Actually, the first Jeff Beck I did at, at Abbey Road. Oh, that was at Abbey Road. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that came between Magical History Tour and the White Album. Huh, and and a highly influential sound. Um, I, so I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> I can say it, it even I, if you don't. You know, it, it, it's it's hard. I I cannot see why the records that I've done have been so influential. I I it, it they they they're good records. That's it for me. It's, right. I I did the best I could under the circumstances, and and people like them, which is great. I. I find it hard to accept the whole thing of them being influential but uh you don't romanticize it no not at all <laughs> well, it's for the rest of us i think it's for yeah. the fans um well uh, otherwise i wouldn't be able to walk through the, the front door of my house my head would be so big but, yeah <laughs> and I've, I've i've seen enough egos in my time that uh i don't want to become one of them what well, the one of the next things obviously the next uh we talked a little bit about uh, working with David Bowie, but I wanted to get a little bit um, of uh, discussion about the sound that um, that Bowie went for and that you guys achieved on Hunky Dory and, and Ziggy. Um, there's something about, I mean, that, again, I'm sorry to say this, but it's an iconic sound of uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> glam rock. And, it, you know, yeah. the, the guitar is a, has a certain... Um, you know, bass-free tone. The uh, the the bass is very punchy. The uh, the drums are very. I don't know what you, you use the word dead. Um, sometimes I think yeah. to describe yeah. the drums, and it's all together. Uh, it makes a very specific sound. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, how did that? Or is it just happenstance that it came out that way, or? There's always a certain amount of happenstance about those things because it, it's all. It, you know, after the fact, it, it, it sounds tried, deliberate. Tried, it, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm after the fact. You say, well, it seems deliberate. You know, like everything seems deliberate, but it, it's some of it is, some of it isn't, and it, it's it's very hard to sort of differentiate which which is which. Uh, yeah, I think you talked a little bit about the way uh, Mick Ronson would um, get a peculiar tone by using a wah-wah pedal and sort of finding a place. Yeah. Uh, which and is it, it's, it, So much of it comes down to... I, I give these talks at universities, and one of the things that I keep... I always try and put across to, to the students. There are two things. One, it's about making decisions. That, that whole decision-making thing has gone these days. And luckily, because I got my start on four-track, I learned very early on the ability to make a decision about how something's going to sound. Yeah. Because you were mixing everything together onto one track. And so you, you had to live or die by the sound you got there. And it, it's very much that kind of thing. The decision, as soon as I heard, like, the first run-through of, of the first number, and just within getting the sounds, I knew... I made the decision what that had to sound what it had to sound like for the entire album, mm. and so there's there's that side. There's also that thing that I put across is it the sound has to start in the studio. Mm -hmm. This whole thing of what there is today of well we'll get it okay in the studio and we can always make it great using plugins. That's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You can't. It, you have to have a great sound in the studio to start with, and so my my job was very much putting across what the, what the artist was getting in the studio, be it the bass player, be it the drummer, be it the guitarist, being the vocalist, it has to start there. So anything that I did from there was based on what they were giving me 
to start with. Yes, I would say, okay, let's deaden that a bit more, let's do this. But bottom line is it starts from them. You know, it may be, ironically, one of the reasons why people do romanticize these things, because I think, I suspect that today that people, even if they don't, know it in, like um, intellectually they can sense the artificiality of certain things you know oh, yeah yeah and that though that music back then you know you hear the guitarist you know it's a, a guitar player he's making mistakes you know the drummer is has a certain feel it, it's all it's yeah. human beings well and it, it's human number one they're not perfect it's not the, the two Oh, sorry, the, the three worst words in the English language for me these days is on the grid. Hmm. I've, I've heard it so often that how to, I've seen on sort of websites someone writing in and, and saying, I've recorded this drummer, but how do I now move him on the grid but have it feel good? You can't. <laughs> A drummer is always going to vary slightly. That's what makes it makes him human that's what gives it feeling yeah and we become so automated the mixes we used to do before automation and everything it was a performance we had to get everything happening at the same time and it, it was a performance these days it's all automated and it feels that way and it's the same with the performances most of the time people don't play together that they once they played, someone go, uh, a technician goes in on Pro Tools and we'll move it all around so that it's exactly on the grid. And it just tends to lose feel. And unfortunately, I think people, are, uh, too many people, don't even understand what feel is these days, right. both in the business and, and the public. And we need to, to get a band that just comes out and happens, both sonically and feeling-wise. And at that point, it will all go back again, and people will start to listen and feel things properly. And, but it just needs that one band to break through to, and do it. Right. I hope you're right. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. You, you see it, uh, I mean, again, I, I think that, that too much of what you hear is just, it's drained of that, it's drained of that life. And, you know, a lot of those old records, they sped up, they slowed down. Um, absolutely. You know, it was part well, of the excitement. I, I, I started... Right, I started to use a click track uh, back really early on. But I, I, uh, when I first started to use a click track, I realized the reason I used a click track wasn't so much to keep the band in time. It was because I used to edit a lot between tapes mm -hmm. to come up with the master. So I, wanted, I needed to make sure as much as possible they were fairly close to, to the uh, correct tempo for, for me to be able to wait it between takes. Right. But I, I, I learned very quickly that if you have the tempo set from beginning to end, it feels completely unnatural. Musicians will automatically speed up when you come to a chorus. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. And so I, I had a, a programmable metronome built for me so that I could program in just a, a couple of notches up for the chorus and then mm. back down for the next verse. Mm. And it, it suddenly, they breathed again. There was life to them. Mm -hmm. And it, these days it's just, you set the tempo when you go all the way through. Yeah, well, you, you know, you talk about uh, starting out on side two of Hard Day's Night. I mean, a lot of those performances were pretty much just in the studio performances, right? I mean... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know... The basic I, track had... The, the basic track had to be because they were all mixed together onto one track. Right, and and there, there was no going. There was no going in saying, you know what, it's all good. Let's just patch up the bass here. You couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was mixed with the drums and the guitars. And I, you know, nothing. As far as I'm concerned, nothing surpasses that stuff in excitement. I mean, that's about as exciting as music yeah. ever got. Yes. Um, well, there, there, of course, there, there is. Uh, we could we could go on on and on this subject for hours. So sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but getting back to um, to uh, David Bowie, after yeah. after that record or those records, you um, I think the sound of uh, for instance, like Aladdin Sane, it sounds a little more expansive to me, like uh, not quite as uh, closed in as the other two records. Is that yeah. a conscious thing or? Well, 
two, two, two reasons for that, I think. One is we started in a different studio. So it, the studio, RCA in New York it was, the studio had a different feel. So that, that made it start to sound different. So that that was continued, but there was also David's music was was changing. It was it was growing, so it needed a bit more of a, a an expansive sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering. It all comes down. It all comes down to what works best for the song. Right. So, uh, just to, I wanted to circle back and just ask you a quick question. When you if you record, do you do you prefer? Getting as much of uh, of the instruments down together or 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 separate. I mean, would you rather have it, most of the band play? You know what? It, it different strokes for different folks. It's, different, it's yeah. all down to uh, the song and the players. With missing persons, which to me feels really good. Now, a lot of those tracks were just Jerry Bozio going into the studio and just completely playing on his own. He didn't have anything, anyone playing guide tracks or anything like that. Yeah. It was, we started off, he got the drum track the way we felt it should be, so it was as good as we could get it. And then everyone else had to match up to that. That worked for that project. Obviously, something like Mahavishnu Orchestra, that has to be much more live. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's down to the music and the players. Yeah, if we get there, there, there is no wrong or right. It, it's it. It's, everything is wrong. Uh, sorry, everything is right as long as it feels correct in the end. Now, to talk about Mahavishnu for a second, you 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 talk about a little, a little bit about how the drum sound, particularly for Billy Cobham's drums, that um, it's kind of uh, really set set a new standard for for jazz drums. Jazz drums used to be recorded. If you listen to the old recordings. Uh, Oh, yeah. Mainly overhead mics or, you know, from a distance. Um, whereas it sounds like you brought a kind of almost a rock drumming um, attitude to it. Is that true? Or? I, 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 yeah, no, absolutely. It's, I've been asked, how did you record? Cobham's kit was so big, how did you record it? And it was, it was exactly the same, just more of it. Mm -hmm. it, it was. I used exactly the same mics, exactly the same micing technique as I used for a Woody Woodman Z. I used that on on Billy Cobham. Mm -hmm. I, I just had to use more mics. Yeah, but that wasn't typical for jazz at the time, right? Uh, that was not in the slightest. Yeah. Not in the, you, you just listen to the difference between uh, In a Mountain Flame, their their first album, yep. and Birds of Fire. Yeah. And the, the sound is true tremendously different yes but the, the original drummer uh, the, sorry the original engineer was he was more of a traditional jazz engineer and I've, I've often I, I've mentioned in the book that one of my big questions has always been why me with with Mar Vishnu because it was so unlike anything that I'd ever done before yeah and no one can remember no one no one's sure everyone comes up with a different idea <laughs> but you know when you think about that stuff it it, it in a lot of ways, it was closer to rock than it was to to traditional jazz. Um, I mean, with the instrumentation yeah, yeah. and the way he was playing, the way John McLaughlin was playing, and you think so? I I I tend to feel that he's st he's still a jazzer mm -hmm. playing with a louder guitar. Well, yeah. To me, <laughs> as, as as I as I say in the book, it's the closest one for me for an absolute sort of jazz rock fusion thing was Spectrum, Billy's album because yeah. with, with uh, Tommy Bonham playing guitar because he he was a rocker that was right. playing on a sort of jazz background so it, it that to me is much more of uh, the melding of the two genres yeah whereas whereas John is he's he's a jazz player just playing loud and distorted I agree yeah I, I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of you know, the, just in terms of the sound, you know, it's a long way yeah. from West Montgomery playing, playing. Absolutely. Yes. McLaughlin was playing. Yes. It probably requires a different type of recording uh, technique. I, yeah. Well, it, it certainly finished up that way. Yeah. And again, I mean, no need for me to say it, but highly influential records, <laughs> all of those. I mean, it, you know, when people, people yeah. talk about bitches brew and, and things like that, but um, you know, in terms of the sound, uh, yep. you you know those the birds of fire really 
set the tone for sound. Um, the way no, I, 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 you know, strangely enough, on that particular one, I completely understand how it was influential because it did it. I can, as a technician, I can hear how it suddenly changed uh, people's perception of what what jazz uh, sounds should or could be. Uh, yeah. That one, that one I, I totally understand being influential from a purely technical basis. Yeah. Uh, and you're right about the excitement on those records, on Billy Cobb's Spectrum and on Birds of Fire. And just oh, a yeah. tremendous excitement. Yeah, amazing. You really caught it. They were so, they were so great to, to, to work on. I'm wondering about... It, it was, go ahead. Uh, I was just say, and it, it came at just the right time for me because I, I, I don't like to... I get bored easily. I, I don't like to keep on doing the same kind of stuff all the time. I'm not one of these these people that if I if I have a hit album, then I'll do 20 more of exactly the same kind of thing. I like to be able to move between things, and so that suddenly coming up came at just the right time. I'd done a bunch of uh, pop albums, and it couldn't have been better for my head to suddenly get into something like that. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, speaking of pop albums, you you know another left turn around the same time is. You recorded uh, a lot of uh, the Elton John albums, which the ones that I think at least have the best songs on them. <laughs> My favorite Elton John songs are on the ones you did. Um, <laughs> so that's all I'll say. Well, that. I had nothing to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they just sound. I do love the sound of that period. Um, I love D. Murray's yeah. bass. I, I always wondered about oh, yeah. how he got that tone, or how you recorded that. Uh, I mean, you really. That was one of the first. I don't know if when I think about like of a well-recorded bass that came through uh so i think it sounds like rocket man and the bass okay. is just crystal clear well i i i just did what i did with everyone else it was a mix of uh, di and his amp and uh mm. just got it till it sounded it seemed to sound right <laughs> yeah and on a lot of those records that, is, that, sorry go ahead no no it's just like that, that's the whole thing it, it's all of these these records were done so quickly. You didn't have time. Oh, Beatles were, were the exception to the rule, but so many of these, like all of Elton's records, the the the, the first few Bowie records, they were all done in like two weeks. We didn't have time to mess around. The the, the musician had to have his shit together, basically, mm -hmm. and so did we. And it was just okay. We like I knew. What I needed to do, much the same as today, I know what I need to do to get a good sound from my perspective. So I've, I've become a creature of habit in that way, and I, I will always tend to do it the same way. And it, with with D, it was very much it's just a DI and a mic in front of his bass and mix mix the two together. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, move on. Yeah, but it was, it was that that simple. And maybe it's just what you're capturing because you. There's, there's a long way. If you think about the just the nature of, um, you know, like the strings that that were used on those records, like the string orchestras were used. You know, heavy, sort of um, these sort of like <laughs> Debussy like string sections would come sweeping in. Um, right. You know, loud. I mean, not not in the background, but like prominent. Right. Um, and it would made it made a very different sound. Then you know, for instance, you know maybe some of the Beatles' use of orchestration. Sure, yeah, and it's we did what we felt was right for the song, right? And other people seem to like it, so that, that that's what it's all about. We 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 do our job, and for for me, it's always been I want I want the act to be happy, and I want me to be happy. If we all like what we do. I, th I think that com that comes across in the recording, and hopefully, if the audience gets a chance to hear it, they will like it as well. My my biggest complaint about record companies used to be when the the public didn't the record company didn't push it hard enough, so that the public got the uh, the opportunity to hear the final product. If the if the public don't like it, have heard it and don't like it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. No problem there. It, it's because I've made a record that I like and that the act likes. And if the public doesn't, fine. But the public needs to have the opportunity to hear it to make their decision. Otherwise, I'm not happy. Yeah. 
that problem's even probably worse today. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, yeah, to a point. Yeah. It, the, it will turn around. It will turn around. Talent will always win out. I, I hope you're right. The, the, we, can I ask you about, like, you mentioned, you talk about monitoring. Apparently, you used to monitor very loudly, um, or very loud. Still do. <laughs> Still do. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just curious, as, just as a technical question, like, how close you are to your speakers? Um, is it, you know, the, most monitoring I've seen done is seems very near field monitoring. Right, which I hate. I hate near field monitors. Uh, they're, they're generally, the, the big ones that I use uh, go some way away. I, I, is that right? I'm trying to gauge uh, what it would be, but I can't. But uh, it's yeah, no, they're not. Up, they're not up really close. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, it's you talk about dimensionality, and I mean, I don't know if you're talking about um, three dimensionality, but that that there is, I do pick up some of that in in some of your recordings. But that, um, yeah, that's what I try. That's what I've always tried to do. is get some depth, even though it's it's only sort of one plane. I try and get it so that it sounds as if it's it's three D. That there's some dimension to it, and that things will be at the back, and when necessary, they'll move forward. Very like the, the the easiest example to give of that my mentality uh, along those lines are the uh, background singers on Walking the Wild Side, mm, who right. go from Excuse me. Who go from way back and come right up to your face? Right. And that's that's just through volume and and reverb. That's what I tend to do via frequencies and volume and reverb. I try and put things into different different places right. so they can still be heard. I think another and then when they need to be featured more, they they can come up a bit more. Right. I, I think another great example of that is um, "Crime of the Century." Uh, you know, th- that record is an audio fi- audio file. Uh, to this day, yeah. audio files really treasure that that recording. Um, it seems like. I was wondering if, you know, I was thinking about that record. I was thinking about, like, Alan Parsons' work with Dark Side of the Moon around the same time. Yeah. It seems to... When do, when do you think that recording of rock peaked? I mean, like, in terms of sound quality. Do, do you see it like that? Do you see, like, a time where there was kind of a, a golden period where... Um, I mean, I, I listened to some of those recordings from 73, 74, and it's just, just amazing. I know exactly what you mean and what you're asking. I can't... <laughs> I think I'm scared to actually give a period because it would show what the downward trend we're on, and I prefer <laughs> not to think of it as a downward trend. <laughs> so, I'm not going to ask you about the loudness wars or anything like that. Oh, no, no, no. But it, it, it's... Uh, no, look, there are great-sounding recordings coming out all the time, right. even today. Yeah, uh, they're not so. It's it's not necessarily the the more popular records that sound that good these days. Uh, right. And, and if you go if you go back to uh, Crime of the Century, at least over here, it meant nothing for a long, long time. Right. It did, we we were successful in the rest of the world. We weren't here. It, it took uh, Breakfast in America before the band actually broke. Right, I know. But but you know, there, there's that, that particularly that one that you did, Crime of the Century, it just holds up as a. I think it, that people really hold up and say this is a great sound, sounding record. It's a great absolutely, record. Period. Absolutely, yeah. I absolutely, I I agree wholeheartedly. But if you would have asked people back then about the best sounding album at that period of time, they wouldn't have said Crime of the Century because it wasn't, <laughs> the act wasn't known. It was only later on, once the band achieved success and people went back, then they suddenly, oh, wow, what a great sounding record. And I think there are a lot of acts these days that come out with great sounding records, but people just don't know about it. Yeah. And unfortunately, the way it is these days, if you don't have success with the first album, the record company's going to drop you. So you never get that chance to, to build the success that people can then go back and say, wow, what a great album that was, that first one, second one that they did. That can't happen. 
Yeah, I I think um, I wanted to ask you a little bit. You were involved with um, All Things Must Pass, George Harrison's record uh, in the beginning, and you oh, also yeah. got involved with the re-release, the reissue, um, yes. right? And you know, I think one of the things I think is great is it, we just talk about how things go through a a reappraisal, and I kind of yes. think that George is getting a reappraisal and <laughs> with the uh, Scorsese movie. And um, I think with right. some of the things that you talk about, people really are talking about, um, I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm a, a lifelong fan of the band and, and I'm seeing him in a completely different light. Um, you know, he always was portrayed as very dour and very, you know. Um, uh, yeah. Which I, 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 I fight that vehemently. I, it's, that's such bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear, you know, because you, you, there is this this whole other side, and you know, usually you say, "Oh, well, you know, people are just saying wonderful things about people who have, you know, passed on." But but uh, there's a different tone. To, I mean, I don't think anybody's sugarcoats at this point. Uh, they did for a while, but you know, John Lennon's legacy is is very much, I think, well understood. You know, like uh, he had his tough points, and he he had yeah. his amazing points. Um, yeah. But I think George's is is less understood. It's just coming to be known as, um, you know, uh, what a great guy he was to be around. I think. Yeah, he um, was an amazing human being. He was. I, it's. He was. He was the, the the Beatle that came out the end of it all. The most human, as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. And it, it's anyone that, that would anyone that goes through what the Beatles went through. Uh, they're never going to come out the other end the same as they went in it's yeah. uh it's like it, war <laughs> that was unbelievable and and the thing is that no one's ever going to go through what they went through again because now it's all known right that kind of fan worship what the the fans are like it's now known and to a point it's expected back then it was completely unexpected i remember seeing interviews tv interviews with them where it was well what, what would you like to happen after this success? And I, I remember Ringo saying he'd like to open up a hairdressing salon. <laughs> and Paul saying, well, it, it would be very nice if, if John and I could maybe write a musical. <laughs> they never expected that what would happen. No one did. I, it's and hard so, to even comprehend from this vantage point. Right. And it's no one's going to go through what they went through. Yeah. But but that record in particular, you know, one of the things you talked about is maybe a a, a mild regret, and and I wonder if you ever think it's a possibility of having a kind of all things must pass uh, naked, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I know it's if George was still around, I would almost guarantee it. Mm. But with George not being around, I don't think it will happen. Mm. It it needs to have his sensibility to it. Yeah, I mean it's a great and record. Got, it's. I, I, Yes, but I, I have to say, if I got the phone call tomorrow from Olivia saying, would you do it, I would jump at it instantly. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd love to, but I, I, to, to really do it justice, I think it, would, it needs George's sensibility to it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that would just really love that because that's one of those where I do feel like where um, there's certain songs, particularly I'm thinking songs like Wah Wah, that, that really probably could have toned down the specter-ish uh, touch you know yep. where maybe it was just a little bit too much um a little more clarity would have been would have been uh, helpful i know yeah, it's like all but, second but, guessing but, but yeah no i know but the thing is there's no way of knowing until you actually get into it once you start peeling away all of those effects mm -hmm. suddenly you might start to find mistakes and all of that kind of thing there might be a certain amount of covering up being covered up <laughs> yeah yes Interesting. What do you? Uh, just a, a question. I, I don't know if you um, you listen to music at home or if you know some people. I don't know. Maybe that you know you like uh, you get home from work. You don't want to have to deal with it anymore. But right, yeah. I want to like you Plum, know. How, like, plum, plumbers have more drips in their house than anyone else. <laughs> right. Do you? Um, I mean, how do you listen to music at home? Do you? Do you listen to an iPod? Do you listen to vinyl? What do you? What do you do? Oh no, no it's it's. I certainly. Oh, excuse me. I certainly don't listen to vinyl. Uh, it's I, I, 
I'll be honest, I don't listen to that much. I think when, when I do listen, it's more just in the car. Yeah. What, what about... I, I, yeah, I know what you mean. I, it's, it's hard to find a time, I think, now to sit down and actively listen, I think, the way people used to. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's just a different... And also the quality. I can't sit down and listen because I don't find the quality is there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I I, I, I I listen to exclusively vinyl when I'm at home and, like, you know, on a nice setup, you know, that yeah, I devoted right. a lot to. And that really yeah. is a pleasure to listen to. But I, I don't, I couldn't, I didn't do that with CDs. I didn't do that with my iPod. It's just in the background. You know? Right. Yeah. It's a different thing. What, what I will say is, uh, <clears throat> oh, I keep on having to clear my throat. I'm sorry. Uh, the, I, I don't know if you know, they're reissuing Ziggy. Yep. for the 40th anniversary, uh, reissuing it yet again. It's been right. done so many times. But I was actually involved this time, for the first time, and I got them to use a gentleman by the name of Ray Staff, mm-hmm. who's head of uh, mastering for air in, in England. Mm-hmm. And he was the guy, I got Ray on board because he was the guy that mastered it originally. And he's still going, and he he still has the same sensibilities that we had when we originally mastered it. Mm-hmm. And he did it, and it sounds amazing. It sounds, it's by far the best version that I've heard since the original. Oh, wow. I can't wait to hear that. And so it, yeah, it's really good. He did a great job on it, and I'm so happy. So finally... Hopefully, people will listen to it and think, "Wow, this is what things should sound like," kind of thing. And yeah. Who knows? Spark something. <laughs> that's 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 something I would love to be influential about. Right, I agree. Yeah, I'll wrap up with just a, a quick question. You uh, you do talk about this. You touched on it before, and I know it's a big deal to you. And I and I do, and I I, I like the idea, you know, that you talk about because I totally agree with it. I'd like you to elaborate on it, but you do talk about the importance of working within limitations, you know, of making decisions. Yes. That, whereas, well, it's, it's that, that. Sorry, as a, go ahead. You are, as opposed to the way, you know, a lot of things are able to be done today, you know, where you can do anything. So, you know, you put it all down and, and then uh, it becomes impossible to sort through or to make a decision on or to, it's almost like the constraints provide some kind of creative juices or something. What, what would you talk about that absolutely. a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, no, abs- absolutely. Uh, I come from the time when uh, acts, part of their recording contract was they had to come up with two albums a year, one every six months. Yeah. And look at the material that came out, the songs that came out from writers having to come up with an album's worth of material every six months. Uh, it was unbelievable. Yeah, and there there was there was no second guessing for recording these days. It would take three or four years before the next album comes out, and a, a lot of that is because well, they'll put something down and then no one can make the decision: is it good, bad? They'll drag it out and drag it out so that when it comes time to mix, they've got a hundred and fifty-five different tracks of which ninety-nine of them don't need to be used but they have to sort through them and all of that kind of thing. Just make bloody decisions up front. Yes, this is going to work. No, it's not. It's not like brain, It's not like a surgeon that if they, if they make a mistake, someone dies. <laughs> right. So it's so that the hi-hat is 2 dBs quiet. I can guarantee you no one in the general public is not going to buy that record because the hi-hat's 2 dB quiet. <laughs> it's... It, it has to come from the material to start with. Records sell because of songs. They don't sell because of sounds, mm. often. There is the odd exception, but mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the musicality of it that people like, that people buy into. If you come up with a melody that you can't get out of your brain, it's, that has nothing to do with the, the engineering. It may have a little to do with the production, but basically it's... it's it's the songwriting. That's the important thing. Yeah, and it's... And, and to, to drag it out over three or four years, oh, is that verse good enough? Let's try it a different way. Let's try... Just do it. Yeah. Yeah, you sort of heard the stories about, uh, who was it, uh, Axl Rose recording Chinese Democracy for 
15 years yes. and you, you just sort of yes. said you you know this is not going to work <laughs> right I mean, there's no way Absolutely. it can you know but no. that no I, I agree with you i i think there's almost you know it's almost first of all it's too in a way it's too simple i think it, on, on the other hand uh now yes. yeah yeah. That like some of the well, and as, as I and as I said earlier, that that whole thing of all of these plugins that people tend to use. Yeah. Uh, we we used to for for reverb, we would have one sync, like we'd have one EMT plate or one chamber, and that would be it for everything. And they're putting everything through the same plate. It, there's a there, it works, it puts them all together. There's a, a, a meshing of everything there. Mm-hmm. Whereas these days, it would be a different EQ, it would be a different reverb for every single piece that they, they decide to put reverb on. And it just keeps everything separated. It doesn't bring yeah. everything together. Right. Uh, it just all of that kind of thing. And as I said earlier, it's get the damn sound in the studio. That's where it if you get a great sound, if you get a good sound in the studio, you don't have to do too much in the control room to make it great. Mm. But if, if you have a right, an okay sound in the studio, you're never going to make it sound great, no matter how many bloody plugins you use. Yeah, you, you do talk a little bit about that. Less is more with the um, like with EQ yeah. and things like that, right? You know that that. You... Well, I, I I just I just did some sessions, uh, just as an engineer. I wanted to get back just into that for a bit. And Bobby Ozinski, my co-writer on the book, uh, he was producing a band. It was a, a hard rock band. And he said, would, would you fancy engineering? I said, yeah, great. And so I went in there, and he was absolutely astounded how little EQ I used. Hmm. It's just I, I know the mics that, that I tend to use, and I, I know what, what EQ works with them. And it was great. There was one day we went between two drum kits, two very different sounding drum kits, and I got the sound on the first drum kit. We got the number that we needed. We pulled that drum kit out, put the second one in. I put the mics in, in the correct places, and I didn't have to change a thing on the board. Hmm. And that probably it has was a, a completely it, it was a completely different drum sound, but that's because the drums were different, not because I did anything different. Right. And that's the equipment and the room, right? I mean. That, well, yeah, that's what you're capturing, and, and 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 knowing it, knowing what you're using. Yeah, you you do talk about being notoriously finicky about uh, <laughs> where you record and <laughs> the conditions. Oh yeah, yeah, because that's it, right? That's everything. I'm sorry. It'd be because that that's it, right? I mean, if you don't have that, wh- well, th- yeah, you can you can get away with with things to a point, but. Uh, like one of the things that uh, one of the stories in the book was trying to record uh, Mahavishnu at Criteria Studios. It, it, the studio was was not designed for that kind of band, so it, it just didn't work. It's like uh, I'm trying to think of it. There are concert halls mm-hmm. which are designed specifically for classical music. The acoustics are amazing mm-hmm. for classical music. And you put a band in there with their amps, and it sounds absolutely atrocious because mm-hmm. it's not made for that kind of volume. And it, it's, it's exactly the same. You, you can do it to a point. You mix and match to a point. But you, there are certain points you can't go beyond because that band won't work well in that studio sound-wise. Well. Wow. Well, I won't take up a lot more of your time. I really appreciate it. This was a it was a pleasure to read the book. I'm thanks for writing it. <laughs> because I you're think... very welcome. It was it was fun for me. I having having now read it, I think four times. <laughs> uh, I, I <laughs> you've had enough. I fed up with reading it. <laughs> I but it was fun writing. <laughs> oh, great. Well, thank you very much for talking to me. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time. 